Hello, everyone. The next session is starting now, so please be seated. I thank you for being here. Uh, I'm the moderator of this session. My name is Maho Cavalier Wehala. I work for the Human League Japan. So this session is Advocacy in Asia. Uh, we hear uh, from the three, three speakers, experience and achievement in working with corporate farmers for cage free campaigns in different countries of Asia, and how veganism is being developed in Japan are the main content of the session. Um, they move into the heart of animal advocacy across Asia. This session is your gateway to understand the unique challenges, successes, and then groundbreaking efforts within the region. Join us to um, discover inspiring stories, collaborative strategies, and empower uh, of collective actions in adv advocating for the um, welfare of animals throughout Asia. Get ready to be informed, inspired, and equipped to make a difference. So I will call the first speaker, uh, Amon Prakosa. Please. So. Amon Prakosa is a managing director at Shinegia, uh, Shinegia Animal uh, Indonesia. The title of the presentation is The Hem Movement in Thailand in Indonesia. So please take away. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi. Hi. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, first, uh, English is my fourth language, so go with me. I will read my script, so to make it clear. Okay. Um, thank you. First, uh, this session is about uh, movement in Asia, but uh, we only present at this moment only in Thailand and Indonesia, so I will focus on the two countries. So, uh, who we are, uh, founded in October 2017, Synergy Animal currently operates in seven Latin America countries, uh, you can see in the slides, and in two Southeast Asian countries, uh, Indonesia and Thailand. And we seek a uh, more sustainable future for the global south, a future in which fewer animals are exploited for food and the cruelest methods of animal farming are abolished. We help work towards societies that are less dependent on animal products, paving the way for the end of animal exploitation in the food and agricultural sectors. We fight for the ends of the poorest practice against animal in the food industry. Our current focus in Asia and Latin America is securing catch free commitments from food and hospitality companies commitment to stop using and selling eggs from cage eggs. In Brazil, uh, meanwhile, we are concentrating our efforts towards ending the suffering of cows and pigs. And our goals, to reduce suffering of animals exploited in the food industry, reduce the number of animals exploited in the food industry, and build a powerful and inclusive movement in the global south. Okay. Um, yeah, so update. Uh, from Indonesia, Thailand. Um, so, this is uh, the latest report from Welfare Matters. Uh, thank you for Wanyi and Divya. So, at this moment, we have um, 62 catch free commitments in Thailand and 67 in Indonesia. And of this commitment, 28 are from Southeast Asia companies, so they are uh, adapting the movement. And just a couple of days ago, um, yeah, congratulations to all of us uh, who make this happen. I know you are there. This is a big uh, commitment for Asia. So, yeah, thank you. And congratulations for everyone who was involved. So, what's the, the meaning of this uh, commitment? So, Jollibee is the fastest growing Asian restaurant chain in the world growing at a pace of over 500 new restaurants per year. And they are also planning to have 500 stores in North America by 2027. So this is a huge uh, victory. And ASCOT has over 
94,000 operating units and more than 64,000 units under development. So making total of all over 159,000 uh, units in the more than 900 properties. Again, uh, congratulations for your hard work to make this happen. And but this is not enough. We have to continue the movement because there are uh, only for Indonesia and Thailand, there are 90 million hands in Thailand and all over 85 million are caged. And in Indonesia, more than 228 million hands living in this kind of uh, place. And yeah. And the outlook, like we secure commitments, and there will be 2025 uh, deadlines. It's a big issue, and we have to focus on this as well while securing new commitments. And from the Chicken Watch uh, website, there are uh, 100, more than 100 country commitments with the 2025 deadline in Asia, and 93 companies do not report the progress. So we will working hard to make them like uh, fulfill their commitment and how we will do that to mainstreaming the abolition of cage in the region uh, I mean uh, Thailand and Indonesia and Southeast Asia at large and yeah this is uh, what we do at this moment in Synergy Animal uh, we just established a new department to focus on community building and I would say thanks to Pavitra and Craig, if you hear, here, uh, you lead uh, our pilot project in Indonesia, uh, through your Asia for Animals Capacity Building for NGOs, uh, you help us to make initial plans in Indonesia. And we also, uh, again, uh, to nurturing the culture of activism, uh, we have online action. We have regularly coordinated online actions, asking volunteers to participate in activities such as contacting companies, leaving comments on social media, or signing and sharing petition. And street action, uh, even like some of you maybe look like, uh, have impression that Indonesia are very active in street action of political movement, but for farm animals, it's new. So we try to make this uh, uh, activity or this movement to the public. So twice a month, together with volunteers, uh, we stand in front of company headquarters or the flagship store, holding banners and signs to deliver our message uh, directed to the stakeholders. And also, uh, we believe in collaboration. We love to work uh, together. And yeah, because we are Synergia, we synergy with others. And how we do that? Uh, we sharing plan and tactics. We actively communicate with other organizations in the region. We share our plans, tactics, and resources to ensure we can actively, effectively support each other and have the best cumulative impact. Also, our collective initiative, uh, since the movement is new and the organization focusing on catch free work are, especially in Indonesia and Thailand, are relatively few, we are eager to launch collective initiatives. And we also support um, new organization or small organization to our granting program. Uh, this program is, uh, we give funding and training uh, to uh, the participant organization uh, for two years. And the training is in strategic areas such as a corporate engagement, campaign, fundraising, and uh, comms. And this year, there are three organizations from Peru, Argentina, and Indonesia are particip participating. And the last, just again, thank you for everyone who helped to make this happen. Um, we carry out the first farm animal work welfare workshop in Southeast Asia with participants from universities in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. The workshop content is provided by leading experts in their fields. and. Yeah, that's a speaker from Malaysia and Indonesia, so we know what's happened in local context. And on this workshop, we had like 1,000, more than 1,000 signs up, and over 400 participants attended the course. So that's a quick update. Thank you.
So, back. Thank you, Amon. So the next speaker is Don Neo. Um, she's from uh, Global Food Partners, Director of Corporate Engagement. The title of the um, presentation is Capacity Building for Cage-Free Production in Asia. This is my good friend, please. Thank you very much, Maho. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> Almost lunchtime, hang in there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, my title of my presentation is on capacity building for cage free production in Asia. Um, I've met most of you, but um, some of you I've seen familiar faces, some new faces, but for those of you who are not aware of um, Global Food Partners yet, we are a consultancy that is headquartered in Singapore and uh, we focus on helping companies implement all these commitments that they have made for cage-free eggs. And we know that um, most of you, uh, many of you, are working very hard to get commitments uh, from these companies. Um, we focus on the implementation of that. And we do that in a number of countries in Asia, including some in East Asia and Southeast Asia, because companies say they require more support in these countries. And the common um, message that we hear from companies is that they have difficulties making a commitment or implementing their commitments in these countries because they cannot find suppliers or the suppliers ha are too small in scale, not able to supply the volume that they need or not able to deliver to the locations that they need or cage free is too expensive. And then if we look at the producer side, Producers often um, produce, some producers have started to transition to cage free production in Asia, but often the scale is still relatively small compared to the battery cage production, and that can translate to a higher cost per egg. And uh, in some cases, producers have told me that in trying to do so, they um, try to Google for information on how to do cage free farming and uh, they do it through trial and error because there's really a lack of resources available in their native language. So we realize that there is a need to build capacity of various stakeholders in the industry so that they have the resources and the knowledge needed for a successful transition in an emerging market such as um, Asia. So with food companies, mainly we work with them to develop localized solutions for each country, um, relevant to them and their suppliers, so that they can implement their policy quickly and easily, and to most importantly, reduce the cost of sourcing, and to solve some of these logistic challenges that we've been seeing. Um, and because most of these commitments are made by multinational headquarters in um, Europe, or in North America, or in some other regions of the world, the Asian offices often are not aware of why these commitments are made or what cage free is. So in initial conversations with companies, often there is a lack of awareness. Up to today, they're still, we're still meeting, say, some hotel managers who say, we're not aware that our company has a commitment. So we realize that there's a need to build the internal capacity of these companies, partly by helping the headquarters train the local teams in sustainability in procurement. And we do that in a way through our online course um, that we have on our academy. We also support them in various ways in communicating um, their commitment to their customers. Um, and for the producer side, we know that cage free is a relatively new topic in Asia for the past few years. And the transition is in its infancy. So rather than trying to assume what the producers need, we actually conducted a survey, uh, a, a research study, with nine universities across the world, and we focused on a number of countries here, six countries in Asia. Uh, we asked um, 202 egg producers in China, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Japan. We asked them a bunch of questions um, using an open, um, using a questionnaire with open-ended questions. So they're able to freely answer um, as they wish. 
And today I wanted to share with you a few highlights from that research. So um, one of the questions we ask producers that are still using cages is, do you need more support to transition? And is cage-free a possibility in your country? And almost all of them across the countries that we surveyed said yes. So the red color um, part of the chart here is the yes. And so next we ask them, so what kind of support do you need? And while you know, they mentioned different factors like financial support or um, market access, majority of them actually, um, it's not showing up on the slide, but majority of them, the circle part in green and purple, uh, is actually technical training and technical advice. So major majority of them said they require more support for that. And even producers that have been producing cage-free eggs for some years, they are saying that 80%, more than 80% 80 of them are saying that they also need more support to solve some of the challenges that they have on the farms. And this, the results of this study is you know, published in the paper, um, and I can give you the link to read the full paper online if you wish. But the results actually matches what we have been hearing from various producers that um, we are in touch with on the ground. Um, some of them have years of experience doing cage-free, but they have been doing it on their own without um, a systematic technical support. And they still face challenges like high mortality, low yield, inconsistent production. And this often translates to um, difficulty, you know, helping companies implement these policies because cost per egg is higher, right? So with these results, we develop um, our training program to help producers optimize their systems and to reduce the cost of production while at the same time improving the welfare of animals. And all these are important to the success and longevity of the transition to cage-free systems. And one way we do that is through an online course. So when producers come to us, usually we start them off with an online course that we have on our academy, so that if they finish the online course, you know, they're pretty more serious about you know, this transition. And um, so they take the basic course to understand um, the fundamental um, of going cage-free. And we have the courses, uh, developed the courses in conjunction with universities such as Aries University of the Netherlands, Gajamada University of the Indonesia, and Tokai University of Japan. And now it's available in different languages. Because one of the common feedback that we hear from producers is that there's a lack of uh, materials in their native language. So we translated all these courses to Chinese, Thai, Indonesian, Japanese, and we're adding more languages soon. So that's just the first step. The next step is to get them to come for hands-on training at the model farms that we have. The first one has um, officially opened a couple of months ago. It's in Jakarta in Indonesia. And that's a photo from the interior of the farm. My colleague Anom there, uh, working with some trainees that were at our model farm for training. And um, so these model farms are showcase of best practices that are localized to the local context because producers, when they visit um, farms in, say, in Europe, they often have a difficulty translating those equipment and those concepts back to local um, their countries. So the one in Indonesia is a single tier system that is more relevant to the Indonesian and Philippine uh, context. Whereas our new model farm in being built in China will be a multi-tier system, and it's a transition from battery cages to cage-free. Um, and these are also not done in silos, it's done in partnership with a consortium, and we get everybody involved in the system to be part of this process. The people that supply the equipment, the lighting, the birds, the medicine uh, for the animals. And so we built the capacity of all these um, actors in the supply chain as well. So these um, model farms not only just train farmers, they also provide training for academics, for other stakeholders, including veterinarians, government officers. And so far, we had already trained farmers from a few countries in Southeast Asia, as well as a group of um, academics from the Philippines, which uh, get, gave very good feedback. And now they're back in the Philippines, and they want to start their own <laughs> model farm. Um, so that's very encouraging. 
Um, then we also partner with other universities and other academic institutions. Um, and the photos here that you see is our recent partnership with the University of Los Banos in the Philippines um, and Shanxi University for the new model farm in China. And besides the training programs that we have online and at the model farm, we also go directly down to the farm to work with the producers hands-on, one-on-one to solve any problems that they have on the farm. And we have done that in several countries in Asia, including China, Indonesia, and Thailand. And uh, as a result, I think these farms are now some of the better you know, examples of best practices uh, in, in this region. Um, and we have formed um, some partnership with producer cooperatives as well, such as the Batangas Egg Producer Cooperative in the Philippines that produces 25% of the country's eggs, as well as the India cage-free and free-range producer associations. So these are mostly small to medium-sized holders. They group themselves together as a cooperative. And we have an um, MOU with these um, associations and cooperatives to train their farmers to guide them to transition to cage-free. And one of the solutions that we have developed to address the challenges that we've been seeing on the market is impact incentives. And for so those of you who are not aware of this program, um, it's developed to address this problem that we have between um, buyers not able to buy eggs because they're expensive and producers being located in one part of the country and the consumption, the hotels are located in another part of the country. And it can often take year, days to transport eggs from one part of the country to the other. Logic costs can be expensive. For example, I know a farmer in, in Indonesia that has to put the eggs on a bus, and the bus will go to the ferry, and it goes onto the boat, it goes to Bali, and then it gets, gets on another bus, <laughs> and it reaches the hotel after a few days. And if it doesn't crack, um, yeah, the eggs will be there, but it will be significantly more expensive. So this is one of the solutions that we developed to solve some of these challenges, especially for remote locations, um, where producers still get the orders for the eggs, but they don't have to deliver the eggs to these buyers temporarily. While they're focusing on expanding their farm, they get the economies of scale that they need. This program helps them get the demand that they need to kickstart the production and to expand. And Companies can also meet their commitments easily, temporarily, if they cannot find the physical eggs, physical cage free eggs located near them. So this is a um, last resort for um, really challenging situations where the market is not mature and companies cannot implement the policies. So if you ever come across um, producers or companies that face these kind of challenges, we'd we'll love to talk to you and um, maybe introduce this program to, um, to them. It is supported by major NGOs, um, campaigning NGOs working on farm animal welfare as a way for companies to fulfill their commitments in very challenging markets. And so as a summary, I think um, to support the K3 ecosystem in Asia, we really have to work with everybody, <laughs> all the stakeholders in the supply chain, the buyers, the producers, the government officials, the veterinarians, provide enough training materials in the local language, whether it's online or offline, have a practical model farm where producers can see the system. And often when they see the system, you can see their eyes light up because they say, oh, this is cage-free, I can do it. When, you know, after presentations and presentations and videos, sometimes they still don't get it. But the moment they step into the farm, you can see the light go up in their head and they say, I can do this. I think I can do this in my farm. And that's what we want to be able to support um, them in the transition and make sure that they uh, have a sustainable and good productive uh, cage free system. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Don. Always interesting. Uh, the next speaker, the third speaker, is um, Haruko Kawano and Hieronimo Square and Beige Products to Japan. So um, 
Hariko is the director and a founder of each project and um, representative too. And then Hieronimo is director. So the title of the presentation is Vegan Advocacy in Japan. So please take it away. And please, um, there is, are you using Huba? Please um, send questions. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. I'm Hariko from Veggie Project Japan and I'm the founder of that. I will be talking about, <laughs> thank you. Okay. I will be talking about vegan advocacy in Japan and we are an organization working to create vegan options in the Japanese market. This is today's agenda. I will talk together with Hieronimo, who has been a volunteer for a long time and then finally has joined it in July this year. Ah, joined it with us in this year. And Budget Project started in 2013 as a student project to introduce vegan options at cafeterias in Kyoto University. This was 10 years ago. Back then, almost nobody else around me even knew the word vegan, and I really wanted to change it. So I aim to introduce vegan options at the most, uh, at the place that most students used every day. We succeeded to introduce vegan options there. Not only that, we also had our university staff became interested in veganism and create a whole vegan section at the university bookstore. Since then, my dream has been to make vegan options available everywhere in Japan, not only in universities, but also in supermarkets and restaurants to make vegan choices something common. In 2016, I made Veggie Project an official organi non-profit organization to continue this activity in a large scale. Let me introduce how we operate. We still support universities and students to introduce vegan options at cafeterias. We sometimes approach universities directly. Other times we support student groups to, um, we support student groups who are doing the kind of work that we used to do at my university. Last year, finally, we could introduce vegan options to Tokyo University, the top university in Japan. Then some universities are following this movement too. Also, we organize uh, seminars and uh, panel talks at universities to topics related to veganism to get next generation's attention. We collaborate with restaurants. We offer free advice to restaurants for introductions of vegan menus. We also have paper and web-based maps to introduce vegan-friendly restaurants. We also have uh, we, the paper veggie map Tokyo Veggie Map is available at Veggie at very common spots such as hotels, train stations, and government information centers. Sometimes we collaborate with local and national government. With um, government, our collaborations are often in the area of tourism. They want to attract foreigners to visit Japan, and some of them are vegetarians and vegans. So we make the best use of it. We provide lectures and consultations. We have also been working as advisors to the Tokyo government in vegan and vegetarian related issues since 2018. For example, on the right is a picture with our members of national government for a project to make a city a vegan friendly spot in Japan. This year, we, uh, they have already started a new project and uh, we have given advice for it. For example, uh, 
sorry. And we are also working as consultants on vegan-related topics for the World Fair to be hosted in 2025 in Osaka. Currently, our main spotlight is collaborations with food manufacturers. We offer comprehensive support in multiple areas, from vegan consultations for new production of product development to vegan labeling. We have introduced more than 1,500 vegan products to, into the Japanese market, and recently it has been become easier to find vegan products in supermarkets or convenience stores. About these collaborations, Helen will want to share an anecdote, so let's listen to him. Hello everyone, uh, this is Geronimo from Veggie Project Japan. So today I've traveled all the way from Tokyo just to tell an anecdote that has somehow shaped uh, the way that I feel about my work in Veggie Project, so I would like to share that with you. So I remember very well, well when companies just as impossible or just egg took over the internet six or seven years ago. Uh, even since I heard about these guys, I became really obsessed with them. Uh, even though they wouldn't sell in Tokyo where I was living, uh, I would follow every tweet, every announcement, uh, every YouTube re review, and even my phone background was a hamburger. <laughs> so <laughs> I really loved their products, and I would really daydream about sinking my teeth into an impossible burger or whip up some eggs uh, using just eggs for my breakfast. So last year, uh, I had an invitation that was too good to be true. Uh, it was a chance to go to the USA. So as soon as I received this uh, opportunity, my mind raised uh, with the plans not only to meet everyone that I wanted to meet in the US, but also about this long-awaited culinary odyssey about eating all of these products. So by the time that I arrived to the US, I had meticulously planned all my days about going around grocery stores and visiting restaurants to try all of these plant-based wonders. So the moment arrived, and I tried all the iconic items that I had long waited for, and I wasn't really surprised. <laughs> My reaction was much more subdued than I had expected. And some of these products were actually very... I, I'm not here to talk bad about other brands. Uh, the point is that this experience made me realize, and it made me pause and reflect that as I thought back to my time in Japan, I had been eating products that were as amazing and sometimes even more amazing than all the more heavily marketed counterparts that we see in the US. And that was right where I was living back in Japan, in Tokyo, I was trying these things. And I'm not talking only about the traditional stuff, uh, not only about the handmade Satan, uh, the tofu, or all the traditional dishes, but also about the egg-free mayonnaises, the almond cheese, and the occasional soy patties. They were amazing, and I was not giving them the credit that they deserved. So I believe that this fact has to do with uh, two things. Uh, one, with the sad fact that all these Japanese brands are not known in Japan uh, as much as any of their American counterparts in any place of the world. And second, it has a lot to do with Japanese manufacturers' way of working. Uh, they have over-the-roof uh, quality standards. Um, so in Japan, like the manufacturing sector, marketing and market research is sometimes a bit weak. Uh, it sometimes takes a back seat, but attention to detail is never in the back seat. It's always in the front. Uh, so whether it's cheese that it melts seamlessly or mayonnaise that has the perfect texture and the perfect aroma, uh, the Japanese food manufacturer has a very high quality standard. So as I boarded my flight back to Japan after being in the US, I felt a really newfound sense of purpose of my work uh, in Japan at Beji Project. Um, I realized that with this organization, we have the chance to bring all these amazing manufacturers to work for the vegan movement, to work for the plant-based market. And that is something very big. So here are some examples of companies that we have supported uh, for a long time uh, in the product uh, development process. 
The first one is a sashimi made from, do you know sashimi? It's like raw fish. Uh, it's sashimi made from cognac potatoes. Uh, I think there are very few alternatives for raw fish. Uh, this is one that uses very traditional ingredient uh, in Japan, and it uses very smallly to recreate raw fish. The second one is uh, QBB plant-made shred plant shredded cheese. Uh, we have a French guy working together with us. We trust the French when it comes about cheese, and he says that it's the best plant-based ever cheese that he's ever tried, and he's been uh, living in Europe for a long time. Uh, the third one is uh, demigrass sauce from the Japanese branch of Heinz. Uh, it's a sauce that is so good that it could go really unnoticed in any fine dining restaurant, I really assure that. So what all of these examples underline is that we have really big untapped potential in the Japanese manufacturing market. Uh, and at Veggie Project, what we're doing is trying to help all these companies do the plant-based shift. Uh, and we do this at different stages. We first catch their attention at food trade shows. These are some pictures of events that we have been hosting. And not, not hosting, that we have been joining. Uh, and after we catch their attention, we help them uh, develop their first vegan products. We do this by giving them a guideline and a standard, because many of these companies don't even know what vegan means. So we uh, try to guide them to know uh, what would make a vegan product and how they could start doing that. Uh, and after the products are released, we help them promote those uh, products on the media. Uh, we also sometimes help these companies uh, make meaningful connections with our people who make, uh, who would make good use of these products. So if any of you guys uh, is looking for very high quality products from Japan, uh, feel free to contact us. We are here to make those connections happen. Okay, so I'm going to leave you back with Haruko for the last part. Um, we will continue to work hard locally with Japanese manufacturers. First, because we believe that they can make amazing products, as Heronimo mentioned. And second, because we want to reach the local, the local Japanese consumers. Supporting local manufacturers is one of the best ways to bring about products that are tailored for this local Japanese public. It also helps a lot that all these brands already have connections with local retailers. And finally, because local production is more sustainable. There is a lot of untapped potential in our local markets. Let us recognize that. And we are not merely importing a global trend. We have some much to, we have so much to offer to the world. Today we talked about the high quality of Japanese manufacturers, but I'm sure that each Asian country has its unique advantages. Some may be more affordable and some may have their unique processing techniques, and some may be familiar with unique local ingredients. All these things can enrich, enrich um, the global vegan landscapes. So we are not just localizing a movement, let's just internationalizing our solutions. This will be Asia's contribution to be a more ethical future. Thank you very much, and let's keep in touch. And I'm sorry, my English is not uh, not good, but um, I am very happy to share. Thank you, uh, Haruko and Hieronimo, my friends. It's re really nice to see the veganism um, spreading in Japan. So uh, please, speakers, come back to the stage, and now we take Q&A uh, Q questions. So there are actually a lot of questions. So um, 
the sake of time, I may not be able to ask questions that you, you sent. So in that case, I'm sorry, but could you ask them directly later? Um, all right. OK, so uh, I think this is for all of you. What differenti differentiates animal advocacy efforts in Asia from those in Western countries, highlighting the culture, societal, and other challenges um, as faced by animal rights organizations in these regions? OK, uh, I'm the only one who's not Asian here, but I will try to reply <laughs> the best I can. Uh, I'm actually from South America, um, and I've been living in Japan for more than 11 years. Uh, so I have seen both movements. And some things that I feel that are very different, uh, one is that we have a very um, low base starting point. Uh, we have very low interest in plant-based options. Uh, we have very low interest in uh, animal welfare, animal rights. Those are concepts that are felt very foreign. Uh, so I think that is a big difference. Uh, I think that the interest, uh, lack of interest in animal welfare, also in, in the case of Japan, it has a lot to do with a lack of interest in social movements in general. Um, it is not very well seen to have a strong opinion or to disagree with others, so it's very hard to create this uh, social momentum kind of thing. And also from, uh, at least in Japan, uh, this, I said this uh, in another meeting and everyone was saying, like, no, it's not true, but in Japan I believe people are eating fairly healthy. Um, at least not so much healthy, but at least not so many uh, too much meat eating related issues. It's much less common than in the West. So saying that veganism is healthy, it's like a kind of a weak statement. So there are some kind of uh, struggles that we have to trying to import uh, the movement just like it is uh, to Japan at least or to other Asian countries, I imagine. Those are some points that I feel are very different. <laughs> Can I add? Um, in Japan, I think the kind of social movement is not welcomed a lot. So a uh, kind of um, mood is very important, I feel. And if people choose more vegan choices and then more people choose it, so this kind of uh, approach is also different, I think. Hello? Um, so I think that somebody else said this, and I'm just you know relaying it. In many countries in Southeast Asia and also East Asia, I think consumers are accepting of cruelty because you go to like a traditional market and you see the animals being killed right in front of you, and you see that they're in cages and people grow up exposed to that, so they don't tend to see anything wrong with animals being confined and not being able to express a natural behavior. So it is a process to um, you know, have those conversations. And also companies may not uh, see the value of, uh, uh, may not receive campaigning well. And so I think, uh, I think gradually there are more and more groups working on ESG related topics, working with investors. I think the financial angle does have um, some push or some sway with these companies. So I think that's the main difference that I see between these regions. Okay, uh, from my perspective, I'm, I'm not, first I'm not uh, directly uh, involved in the like, movement in like Global North, but from my observation and also from the two days or one and a half workshop uh, that we went. So I think uh, first in Asia it's a new movement and all of us need know that public awareness is it's, uh, lower. And, but I think the two main challenges is uh, lack of funding. Like uh, it, if we compare the investment in animal culture in Asia to funding the, to the organization in Asia, it's, it's nothing. So I think that's, that's the biggest difference uh, compared to the, the movement. Like uh, we lack of funding and uh, talents who want to work in this uh, movement. So yeah, I think that's, that's make a big difference. And also uh, the political difference, how uh, the politician make like a decision or legislation process, it's 
it's very different compared to the, the let's say, uh, European Union or the United States. Thank you. Okay, so moving to the next question. How do you encourage NGOs which focus more on positive campaigns to collaborate with NGOs which focus on pressure campaigns enforcement? What if the positive campaign NGOs refuse to talk to pressure campaign NGOs while communicating with same co corporations? What can we do to reduce the work redundancy? Interesting question. Yeah, maybe I will uh, share my opinion. Uh, for the last uh, two commitments, I saw it's it's saw the example how uh, pressures and uh, positive or uh, persuasive and pressures approach works well. Like these two commitments coming from like without. Uh, I said, like communication with the campaigns organization. Even the camp uh, for the Jollibee, there's a campaigns like uh, led by Open Wing Alliance, and it's very like uh, I would say aggressive campaign. And in the end, the Jollibee talk with others uh, persuasive organization, and they make this commitment. So I think that's a good example how it work uh, both. And for the Ascot commitment, it's we haven't have a campaign, but they make commitments, even they didn't talk with uh, the campaign organization, just receive our emails and they talk to others, uh, persuasive organization, and they make this commitment. So I would say it's in Asia, this uh, alignment is it's pretty good, and we've, we've like kind of coordinating or we've following others' movements, so I think it's no redundant. Uh, we are not the KG free organization, and, uh, but I think all the approach are very valuable, and um, a lot of approach makes sometimes change. So uh, we need to respect each other first, and um, but the very good uh, important point is the we need communication, and uh, we need to be close to the people who are talking. Otherwise, if they have bad impression about our activities, they don't open the mind. So <laughs> we need communication and we keep good um, relationships. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. So another question. Uh, uh, what are the main challenge to um, that farmers of cage free egg producers face on the farms? Is there more disease or behavior problems that um, of the hen? Maybe it's It's definitely. It's definitely. Yeah. It's definitely not easy to for a, a farmer that's been like doing battery cage farming for decades to suddenly you know go cage free it is a, a lot more learning in terms of like how do you manage ha the hands how do you um, prevent disease and uh, it can be done because you know other regions of the world have experience uh, more decades of experience doing this and they've done this well so the knowledge base is already there we just need to localize it you know to the to the local context um, and relevant training, relevant uh, good guidance is very crucial in the early stages because we see the same mistakes <laughs> being made over and over again because of the lack of guidance. So I think having guidance early on in the process to pick the right equipment to prevent um, certain designs from like causing problems, uh, that's been helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm gonna take one more question time, but um, one more question. Southeast Asia uh, presents so many diverse culture contexts to navigate, yet, yet, as the presentation and this conference itself, summit, testifies too, there is already a lot of collaboration and appetite for more. What are the key challenges for more collaboration and potential solutions? Uh, so, but, uh, but I think it's uh, communication is the challenge. Sometimes uh, maybe we've 
we've done align our uh, tactics with others and in the end like maybe the red redundancy happens or sometimes like uh, it's it's not happens uh like it's not happens uh thanks that we've we've agreed on this like claiming uh who win this victory i think that's probably can be the challenge but uh at present i think it's it's not happened yet and communication if we can do like more co communication and align our tactics that would be uh no challenge uh, for for in asia this anybody yeah. Yeah. Um, even in Asia, there are so many diversity and each country has each um, culture and even in the same country, depending on the area, people react differently. So uh, we really need a very, um, very sophisticated approach each section, uh, each areas and also we need to understand the background each other as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, all your answers and thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, so I think this is going to be the um, closing of the, this session. Thank you for, again, please join me giving applause to all the great speakers today. Thank you so much. And so there's an announcement, so lunch, the venue has changed. It's at the Junior Manhattan on this floor. So not at the, um, yeah, it's changed, lunch uh, at the Junior Manhattan on this floor. Okay, well, thank you very much for your um, attention and enjoy your lunch.